everybody to Inside Boxing Weekly on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Goodpasser. Right now, I want to welcome in my co-host, Jeremiah Pricer, who we don't have a good nickname for yet. How you doing, Jeremiah? I am doing very, very good, Mike. I want to thank everybody who tunes in week in and week out, especially guys like Rob Day. We appreciate it very, very much. Thank you once again. And I also want to welcome in a man who I didn't know if he'd be able to recover from last night's Mayweather-McGregor debate because I think, from what I saw, ABC News ran a poll and like 95% said I kicked his ass on a debate. Help me welcome to the show John Einreinhofer. Must have been one of those uh, Trump-inspired polls, Mike. It was fake news. Yeah. But that's Very all fake news. I'm, I'm, re- I'm ready, I'm ready to go. I'm, re- I'm ready to be in the ring again one, just one night later. Here I go. All right, guys, I want to remind you all to check out our sponsors, which you can go to thegruelingtruth.net, click on the logos, take it directly to them. we got replenishingcaretechnologiesinc.com, and we also have powerplusmouthguards.com, so make sure you check both of those out. So we're going to go ahead, we're going to get into this pay-per-view last Saturday night, very controversial, two out of three fights, or two out of four fights. Um, we're going to start off first, uh, we're going to go with Dimitri Bivol. TKO4 over Cedric Agnew, which I know a lot of people thought this might be a good fight. Um, Bivol looked really solid in this fight, Jeremiah, and Agnew just looked like he's just an average fighter at best. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a reason why I spotlighted Bivol uh, in an article a while back. I mean, I, th- I think it, uh, before his last fight. I mean, I've watched Bivol ever since he was in the WSB yeah. or the World, World Series of Boxing. I mean, he looked fantastic in there. I mean, this kid really looks like he's a good addition uh, to an already hot light heavyweight division. I mean, there isn't much that he doesn't have. I mean, he's got quick hands. He seems like he has good pop. Not not awe-inspiring pop, however. I mean, it, it does seem like, you know, when I was watching him take apart Agnew, you know, it did seem like Sergey Kovalev hit a bit harder. But he, he's just got a lot going for him. I mean, combination punching. Uh, he understands distance and timing well. I really liked what I saw. Um, if there's anything, however, that I would like to see him implement a little bit more, it's it's probably body punching. I mean, that's probably that's about the only thing that I didn't really like. I mean, he he tried to open Agnew up. Whenever Agnew would you know go go on the ropes, put the earmuffs on, uh, Bivol he seemed a little bit hesitant about trying to open him up. Uh, you know, over time he he started to figure it out a bit more, and he, you know he'd throw the looping overhand right around the guard, um, but. It, I liked what I saw, and I think he's a good addition to light heavyweight. Hopefully he learns from this uh, this fight, and he does go to the body a bit more. But, again, I think he's one of the better prospects. Be- between him and Gladsdick, uh, you know, that, that's a tough one for me, but um, very good prospect. Yeah, and the thing that Bavall really impressed me with, John, was the fact that when he got Agnew in trouble, he didn't punch himself out real quick. He took his time. He set up his shots. And he disposed of him the way a seasoned pro would. So, I mean, I know the body punching thing is a concern. There's other concerns. I mean, mainly we haven't seen him against a top flight fighter yet, so you don't really know what's going to happen there. But Bavol looks like he's the real deal and is going to be somebody that people are going to have to deal with in the future. Yeah. First, let me look at the po- you know, looking at the positives. Um, with Ward ascending now to the, the true light heavyweight title, in, in my opinion, uh, opens up a spot in the top ten, uh, even when you're only ranking eight divisions. I, I think for me the ten spot would be between Bivol and uh, David Benavides, and I think Bivol gets a slight edge there for me. Uh, I, think he, I, I think he does hit very hard. I think he's, myself, I think he's a big puncher. Uh, I like his I like his power a lot. Uh, my only thing here was that uh, despite his record and the fact that he'd been in with Kovalev, you know, Agnew to me was a no hoper, and I think the odds reflected that. Frankly, even though he's farther off the radar screen, I think uh, Samuel Clarkson was a more dangerous opponent. So I'm still looking at Bivol's fight before that uh, as the more impressive win. Not because Bivol did anything wrong in this one, and I agree with you, Mike, that I always look for a fighter that takes care of business against somebody that he should, that's where your best prospects, your best up-and-comers, your real contenders come from. So he, he passed that test with Agnes. So no criticism there. Fighting style-wise, my only criticism of, of him is I, th- I think he, the guy's a bit mechanical. 
Uh, and I, I think he's a legit top 10 guy al- already, even if you rank only eight divisions, and that really is the true elite of the sport, in my opinion. So I think he's there. I don't have uh, any uh, doubt that he's, he's a threat, but I, I think he's a little bit mechanical. He reminds me a little bit of that older European-type style. He, you know, he's got power, but, he, but he's a little bit mechanical, and I think when we do see him against another legit top 10 opponent, uh, outside of maybe Cleverly, who's just on the borderline there. I think he'll blast out Cleverly, but against others in the top ten, the, that mechanical style could be a bit of a vulnerability. All right, so that will bring us to the next fight. Now we're getting to the controversy. Before we do that, though, I want to bring up, just like Jeremiah brought up Bob Day, I want to send a shout-out to Denise Wards, who is always asking me to tag her in the podcast. Denise, I would like to say, and Jeremiah has known me for you know a couple years now. Jeremiah can vouch for me here. I forget a lot of things really easily, so I apologize that a lot of times I'll forget to put, forget to put you in there. But I'm getting better at it. I think I made it today with that one. So, Denise, thanks for listening. Thanks everybody for listening. Um, let's go to Guillermo Rigondeaux against Moises Flores. I think everybody knew this was kind of a mismatch coming in, no matter how you know HBO might have wanted to talk it out, like Flores may have a puncher's chance. I mean, Rigan Dial is always a slick defensive fighter. But the question is, I mean, what, the, what, what happened at the end of the fight? I mean, you had him holding and hidden. There was no break him up, warn him, anything like that. And then you get a knockout that's clearly after the bell, John, I mean, do you think the right decision was rendered in this? And if you don't, what do you think the correct decision would have been? I always pride myself on having uh, – I, I like to think I think about and I have pretty strong opinions. I'll tell you, Saturday night, I, I was surprised at myself that, that these, these things are, were very hard to sort through, that Flores, Rigondeau, and the, the Ward Kovalev, you know, in certain degrees, but, but stay, staying on topic here with – uh, Rigan Diao and Flores. Uh, Dan Raphael just reported within the last hour that Nevada is going to change it to a no contest. So apparently that's going to become the decision. But uh, I don't know. I, I was troubled as much by the sequence of Rigan Diao as that final punch, which I was troubled by that as well. But I mean, he, he wasn't just like holding Flores behind the head, which is still a foul, like you know, Lennox Lewis would do where you're, you're trying to kind of get the head in position and then throw a shot. He, he was grabbing him behind the head and, and pulling his head into his shots. He, he did that a few times before he threw the punch after the bell that hit Flores and Flores went down from. Dracula did nothing. He did nothing about the grabbing behind the head. He didn't react properly to the punch after the bell. Uh, so, again, getting to the original question, what, what should the result be? have been uh i suppose in the uh, jeremiah and i had discussed this right after the fight on social media you know i i think the rule really is that you know flores is given five minutes to continue and, and if he can't even if it's from a foul he loses by ko now in recent years i think understandably out of an abundance of caution for safety they have gotten squeamish about having fighters going back in there with at least a potential head injury after they've been fouled and something happening. So uh, it doesn't seem like when the punch is from something other than a blow blow, in other words, if it's these after the bell head shots or if there would be another foul with a head shot like that and somebody goes down, I think we're beyond the days really when you're going to see a continue. Although let me correct myself. We saw uh, Thomas Williams, uh, get hit by Marcus Brown when he had just hit the canvas and uh, they gave Williams the time to recover and he went on and fought and ended up getting stopped after that. So it, it's just a mess, basically. It's, it's called inconsistently. You know, what I, I suppose, uh, although I don't know, you know, you, you say no contest. I don't, I don't like the no contest thing, really. To me, it should be either DQ, DQ Rigondeau or... Uh, you know, let, let them win by KO. I mean, not, no contest is kind of a cop-out. Yeah, and my problem is this. I, me and Jeremiah talked on the phone after the fight. I thought it should have been a no contest then. But from looking at it again, even though that I know that Flores, when he went down, he's looking up, 
he lays his head down, he goes to sleep till the count of ten, and then he jumps up. So I think he was looking for the DQ, but it doesn't change the fact that the punch was solidly after the bell, and I don't care that he swung too. He didn't land. And, I mean, if you swing a punch at the end of the round and you miss, they don't take a point away from you ever that I've seen for that. So he missed. But on top of that, you had the repeated fouls in the last ten seconds. And this, this all follow, falls on Vic Draculich, who sounds like a bad character in a Frankenstein movie. But I think that it should be a KR. I think it should be a DQ win for Flores. But I think that would never happen. I think he could have pulled a baseball bat out and beat him with it <laughs> after the bell, yeah. and they still wouldn't take Rick and Dial's title away from him because, let's face it, there's no money to be had in Moises Flores. Um, what do you think, Jeremiah? Well, and, and, and that's part of the – that's the funny thing, right? I mean, uh, there's no money in Flores, you know, in the in – the, the, uh, one of the complaints about Rick and Dial has been, you know, there's not much money into him. But my, I think by the, strict, by the strictest standard – of the rule, you probably favor in, Mo- you know, in, in Flores' favor, right? I mean, really what, what happened was a foul. You know, he acted as if he couldn't continue. You know, again, from, from a fan's perspective, I mean, I, see, I, I was watching the British feed, and so I'm listening to Pauli Malinaji berate Flores for, for faking it. I mean, you look at the replay, and he's clearly laying down. And, you know, one thing from my perspective is, you see this. You see this a number of times. Whenever there's a referee who's stern with a fighter, you know, whenever he's just like, "Hey, hey, get up! All right, stop! You know, stop messing around. I'll give you five minutes, and then we'll continue." I mean, it, it, it's surprising how quickly guys will, you know, they'll perk up and and act right once that, you know, once a referee gets in their face and tells them to continue. Um, you know, so I, I'm conflicted here, uh, like a lot of us. I mean, you know, there was clearly a foul, and again, I I think regardless of my own feelings about. Flores laying down, um, you know, really by the rule book, you should you should probably call it a DQ in in Flores' favor. But again, you know, you know, I'm conflicted because you see the the aspect. It's it's like you don't want a guy to lay down and win a title, right? I mean, it's it, it's like he got hit and then he realized what he could do, and so he just acted like he was knocked out. I mean, that feels wrong to me as well. But again, I think by the strictest standard, you probably want to go by you know, the, the foul that actually happened. And, and like a guy said, uh, you saw this, John, you know, the guy said, well, if, if you're a referee and you decide to get, you know, Flores up and you tell him to continue, you know, that, that feels like a liability, right? That's a liability on the, the, the athletic commission's hands. If they let him continue and he gets seriously hurt, well, you know, they're, they're going to have somebody breathing down their neck because they let a guy who was, "Quote unquote knocked out," continued. So, in a in a way, I don't mind a no contest ruling because it kind of just, you know, it just kind of rem- I don't know. It feels like it remedies the situation. It just it just makes it a clean slate. But you know, it know. remedies the situation completely. What's that? If Vic Draculich doesn't screw this up, because if he it, breaks them when he's being held and hit, and the round ends on that. That's what I, I mean, thought. He didn't do his that's job, and it's just too. like weeks. And I hate to say anything about Weeks, because I think Weeks overall, as referees go, I'm not huge fans of any referees, but he yeah, really does a solid job. But, I mean, this fight, and the thing that really got me on this fight, Jeremiah, was the fact that I am so sick of during a fight, anytime somebody does anything remotely wrong, Roy Jones Jr. always has to say, well, they'd take my license away if I'd have done that, Jim. Yeah, I'm I'm tired of hearing that from Roy. I mean, I, I I've respected Roy as a commentator over the years. I mean, he's got some good insights. I mean, you 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 can tell that he's been a fighter for a long time, right? I mean, it's like Pauli Malinaji. I mean, some of the things that they say, it's insightful. You like to hear it. There's nuance to it. But uh, I mean, you this goes all the way back to the Golovkin Lemieux fight when Golovkin hit Lemieux late, and you know Golovkin apologized immediately. Lemieux didn't decide to lay down and act like uh, you know Andre Durrell there. Um, you know, and, and Roy Jones was saying the same thing after that fight. Well, oh, you know they would they would have uh, disqualified me for that. And, and when you look at actually what, because because he's obviously referencing the Montel Griffin fight, and anybody who's watched that fight, that was a far more blatant foul than the Flores. Rigondeaux fight, the the Lemieux uh, Golovkin one. Uh, so I, I don't know. It's it's just obnoxious, and I don't say I don't think there's any credit to it. And again, we've talked about this at length. Where 
Roy's been credited a few things in his career. It's not like he's always gotten the shaft. I mean, he was always his own promoter. He got good money. They stripped uh, Darius Mikulszewski of his title, you know, in an effort to crown Roy Jones the king. So it's not as if he hasn't gotten some handouts. Um, but, yeah, I'm tired of hearing it. Yeah, and I'm tired of hearing Jim Lampley. And the fact that you had Bennett on there from the Las Vegas Commission saying that HBO told them it was clearly before the bell, I don't believe anybody at HBO ever told him that. I believe they were just saying that he's going to cover it up as much as he can because they're not taking the title away from Rigondeaux no, no matter what happened. And to watch Lampley try to kiss his ass and say, well, I'm really sorry. if it's, I mean, shut up, Lampley. I mean, the dude's been doing this way too long. I mean, it's to the point where I would much rather watch Showtime than HBO anymore, and it has nothing to do with the fights. It's the fact that Al Bernstein, I think, is a great announcer, and I like Pauly Malinaji. And the thing is, when I watch Showtime, there may be some times where you can tell who they're favoring in a fight, but with HBO, you can always tell who they're favoring in a fight. Always. John. HBO's coverage has declined. There's no, there's no doubt about it. They, they were the best at one time. They lived up to expectations. And it's declined we'll since Barry Tompkins left. Well, I, 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 I thought, I think Barry got better as his career went on. I wasn't a huge Barry Tompkins fan when he was on HBO. I thought I wasn't was, either. I'm just, I said it was better <laughs> with him. I have no respect for Jim Lampley. Jim Lampley was Lampley a pretty was good ABC for college studio guy for college football in the early '80s. I thought Lampley had a he, – he picked up on the boxing when he got started. I thought he had a good run for a long time. But there's something I agree – I don't disagree with, with what we're discussing. He, uh, there, there's somewhere along the line – I think it's almost that – and they shouldn't. It's their job. They get bored and they want to try to become analysts, and that's when you get Jim Lampley jumping in, you know, saying Freddie Roach is the greatest trainer of all time <laughs> because he, he had Miguel Cotto. He just, he just turned him – all around, and, and it was remarkable. It was remarkable until he got in with uh, Canelo Alvarez, then it wasn't remarkable. You know, it's just, it, it just, Lampley should stay out of the analysis like that, you know, for the most part. And uh, they do, they did, I, I, when they used to be criticized for it, I thought some of it was unjust, but I agree. You know, you, you look at the last 10 years or so, they, they just, they just favor certain guys, and they take a line early in the fight, and then you've got the insane-sounding Harold Letterman jumping in there, taking the same line, and, and it just makes your head hurt after a while. I mean, you're ready for the – you are ready then. Well, for, this one was a little time. different, though, because Kovalev, Ward, of course, Ward with the TKO in eight. Um, I mean, actually, the scoring by the HBO judge, Harold Letterman, actually was the opposite of what, you know, Lampley and the crew, Jones and Kellerman thought. So there was that, but – Let's go that's ahead unusual, your... though. That, that's unusual, though. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying that was one of the few times it wasn't like that. But when we look at the fight, I mean, I don't think anybody really expected Andre Ward to knock out Sergey Kovalev. There was controversy there. Um, there's a referee in weeks who did not do his job there. The blow was clearly blatantly low because you're hitting letters on there. I'm not talking about every blow. There were a lot of borderline blows. But that blow that led to the stoppage of the fight. I don't know if you agree with me or not, John, but I think right there, there should have been five minutes for Kovalev to recuperate from it because you could not stop that fight on an illegal blow. Yeah, here's, here's what I think. Another one that I usually feel I have a strong opinion on, and this one was tough to categorize. I think this is finally the way I would have to categorize this one, that Kovalev was on his way out. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and Weeks missed the low blow and stopped the fight, which is obviously a really bad call. Uh, I was about to give the round to Ward 10-8, uh, you know, had Kovalev survived, and, and not considering if a point would have been taken away if, if Weeks caught it and called it properly. But I guess that's going to be my final analysis on it, that Kovalev was on his way out. Uh, he got hit with a low blow, and Weeks made a terrible call in terms of stopping it on a low blow instead of coming in, warning Ward, taking a point, uh, letting you know the round end, and then seeing what happened after that. I think I think Kovalev was on his way out, but uh, it didn't it didn't end properly. And Weeks has said that himself on Twitter, which was somewhat unusual. But I agree with you also, Mike. I do. No, hold on, Weeks, Weeks did like. not say that on Twitter. 
That was not Weeks' Twitter account. Okay, all right. So I, okay, because actually I, I retweeted that that morning, and then Sheila wrote an article about it for us at thegrillingtruth.net. But I happen to be friends with Tony Weeks on Facebook, and I sent a Facebook message just on the off chance that maybe I'd get a response. And the response I got from him was, I don't have Twitter. Okay. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good reporting, Mike. I was wondering if it was fake when I saw it at first, and then I yeah, because I didn't want to run her story with that tweet in it if it wasn't true, and it just seemed weird to me that Tony Weeks would only have you know the morning of that fight three hundred and seventy followers. Okay. Yeah, and it was so good. I mean, at least we got that clarified. I, I think I'm good at not falling for the internet bait like that, and I didn't initially on that one, but then. I, I can't think. I thought I saw it on one credible source, and that's when I changed my mind. But you know, I think this. I think everybody is so used to people not taking responsibility for their screw-ups anymore that everybody just wanted it to be real. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. you know, just, just, to, just to jump in real quick, actually, tons of people thought that was a real tweet. Uh, tons of my friends on Facebook retweeted. But if you go on Twitter... If I'm not mistaken, the top comment is from Al Bernstein, who who commends uh, to, know. You know, the, the <laughs> fake Tony Weeks. He, he's like, he's like, wow, take, you know, it takes a lot of uh, takes a lot of grace to say this, and you know, it's if somebody corrects him. They're like, no, this isn't Tony Weeks, and he's like, oh, oh okay, yeah. So I mean, I we think- all fell for it, but like I said, I think it's because everybody, because I think Tony Weeks is a good referee. I don't know what you guys think. But he seems like the kind of guy that would make a statement like that if he screwed up. Well, he, I agree. I do have certain refs I like, and Weeks is one of them. You know, he, 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 missed, he, he missed that call at the end, uh, but he normally is a good referee, and he's not. You know, see, to me, I think all three blows at the end, all three of the final blows were all low. And they could have been. And I've seen, see, I've seen Dracula, which have a lot of struggles, a lot of crazy finishes, a lot of bad calls. Well, Dracula uh, just sucks, so I'm not even going to defend yeah. him a little bit. Well, well and we, doesn't, that, doesn't that kind of summarize the night? I mean, so you, ha- you had two, uh, three pound-for-pound guys, you know, in contest. I mean, this was Regan Dial's most competitive fight, at least on paper, uh, right. since, the Do- since the Donaire fight. I mean, the Ogbeko, Ogbeko was, was old as dirt, you know, when he fought Rigondeaux, but this was Rigondeaux's most competitive-looking fight on paper going into this. And then you, you had referees who couldn't get it together. I mean, it, you hate to see stuff like this. You hate to see referees just well, kind of I, I'm ruin- not going to hold the main event against them because, like I said, Weeks is normally pretty decent. But Dracula yeah, should not it- be in an event like that. Yeah, but isn't that isn't that sort of the problem? I mean, even the good referees, you, you still think they're on the payroll of a lot of these guys. I mean, when they have bad nights, a lot sometimes they're yeah. just odd, oddly bad. But, well, but because that's, that's, that's the history of boxing to a large extent. Yeah, isn't it though? I mean, I mean that's you, just you, like me. I mean, I fully assume the next Mayweather fight is a joke in a circus because that's what he's been over the last few years. Yeah, well, it's unfortunate that we've kind of come to expect that sort of stuff. But just to give my opinion on on the finale of the Kovalev Ward situation, I, I do think I, I agree with most people that Kovalev was on his way out. I mean, it, it, he had the feel that he was waning. That obviously, right, the right hand that hurt him was fantastic. Uh, you know, pinpoint right on the chin, buckled him. This is my this is my thing. I mean, you just don't like to see it finish like that. But imagine that you know Kovalev gets five minutes. He takes the full five minutes to recover. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we were nearing the end of the round. So you know, let's say Kovalev takes five minutes. He survives the end of the round. I mean, do we have a different sort of fight? I mean, probably not. I mean, I think I, we know, could I have. I, I don't think you could say probably not because I think this. I think that Kovalev fought tired the last two or three rounds and. I don't know about you, but I had Kovalev winning the fight at that point. I had him winning, but I thought he was done. I had him winning, but I thought he was done, and he was going to lose 10-8 at that point. Wasn't yeah, but you know what? Bad. If he's not being hit low all the time, maybe he wouldn't be so tired. Well, I mean, if if he gets if he gets that five minutes, and then he you know he only has a little while to survive until the end of the round. So I mean, he's gotten you know pretty close to six minutes six minutes worth of recovery time. I mean. Like you said, I mean, Kovalev was tired, but he was he was still throwing. And you know, the fact that Ward landed the right hand that that was kind of that was clearly his best shot of of you know their two fight series. 
Uh, again, we don't know, but, th- but that's sort of the problem. That's, that's the biggest issue I have is it was a high-level fight. I mean, I thought Kovalev was edging the fight. It looked like Ward was com- coming on. And then we just had to have a fight between the number one and number two pound guys taken away from us like that. It, it, yeah, it but just... it was going to be taken away anyways because if it would have went to a decision, they were never letting Kovalev win that fight. Right, right. Two judges had it for, I, I think they had it one or two rounds for Ward, and, yeah. one, and, and Rock one, Nation is an absolute, complete abomination anyways. I mean, if you watch the, not, not just because of the events of the fight, but the fact that you've got fighters like that, and you've got, what, a third of the arena at least empty? And then on top of that, when you watch Kathy Duva try to answer questions from the media, you've got fans that were let in, screaming at her, making general asses out of themselves, when there's not supposed to be fans at the post-fight press conference. So, I mean, overall, Rock Nation was a joke. Hopefully, they don't have another big fight, which means hopefully Andre Ward retires, which I don't care either way, but Andre Ward's history is we're not going to get a fight anytime soon. I think, I think and it'll fit with other news, you know, we got today, you know, this, this almost could be the, the crowning glory of showing how the HBO, HBO model was just irreparably broken. Uh, and, and that's w- in conjunction with the promoters that they deal with. It's HBO and the promoters they deal with, that combination. That you had a pay-per-view that nobody bought with the star, supposed stars of the show, of course, like Jer- Jeremiah said, th- three of the four guys in the main event, the semi-main event, who were uh, on people's pound-for-pound pound lists. And, and you had, you know, you know bad endings with, which H, with HBO, you know, you know sh- showing the replay and, and, the, and the Nevada Commission. And, and why that connects to pay-per-view for me is, look, if I'm watching that on ESPN, I'm disappointed, but I'm not going to bed so angry that I just spent, 55 bucks or 70 bucks or 100 bucks and that happened. You, you can't have that to fans that spent that money, even though very few chose to do so for this one. It, it, the, model, the model just doesn't, doesn't work anymore. It's a suicide mission every time they run it out there at this point. And this one obviously was, again, you don't know if this is just Internet stuff or not, but, but you did read the real percentage deal. It could be true if that pay-per-view sold 50000 or something like that. You know, there's rumors that Kovalev made $14,000. Um, yeah, Kovalev maybe, was getting screwed in this entire deal no matter what. Yeah, so there's all kinds of rumors, and there was no doubt that he was only getting a percentage of the pay-per-view sale. So whatever he got, if it was more than $14,000, it wasn't much. So it didn't work for him. Uh, Rick and Dial was getting very paid a very low amount. Flores was getting virtually nothing. Uh, it, 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 it's a model that doesn't work anymore. Uh, you know, Al, Al Heyman was, you know, three years ago with the PBC, even for all the people that want to criticize it. Uh, and it's had its ups and downs, but, but he was a visionary in the sense of being a person to try to do something about this completely broken model. And yeah, and Thurman going, Porter like, was a fight they probably would have tried to put on paper, pay-per-view if this was five or ten years ago. Exactly, exactly. And, and you know, yeah, now, Bob Arum would have. It yeah, happened. and it did good numbers. And I think what you're getting to, John, is what Bob Arum announced today, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I'm getting to is that's big news for all of us, but it's, it's huge news. It fits to me in that sense what we're talking about because – it's all, and, and I don't blame HBO for not buying Aram stuff. A lot of people do, and I've seen, to me, there's some commentators and, and boxing Internet writers out there who do shill for some of these promoters, and they were saying HBO doesn't care about boxing and how dare they not offer this money. That's not HBO's fault to stop paying Aram for the dreck he's been giving them for uh, a, over a decade now and then saying, okay, it's going to be on pay-per-view and then just trying to fleece the fans. They did the right thing to shut them down. Uh, you know, they, they should have they should have shut down this Rock Nation thing and said, we're, we're not doing a pay-per-view with you on there. It's going to be regular HBO or you're on your own. But now Bob Arum has finally thrown in the towel, at least for now. Pacquiao Horn is going to be on ESPN. They said uh, Lomachenko and Salito will also be on ESPN. So, uh, you know, that, that is a direct result to me of, you know, what Al Heyman and PBC did when they started getting fights on basic cable and network, putting pressure on De La Hoya and Arum and HBO to do something differently, and also Showtime's commitment to, 
uh, getting some good fights together, you know, working closely with AIM and being flexible. Look, Showtime's put on the British stuff in the afternoon. Showtime let fights like Thurman Garcia be on CBS, um, Thurman and Porter. That takes flexibility on their part. They had to be creative. They had to maybe make a little sacrifice, and they did it. Uh, that's not what you were seeing at all on the HBO, Bob Arum, the La Jolla side, Rock Nation main event. So uh, it looks like maybe that, I would say this probably is the end. And I think that's a good thing at this point for boxing. All right. Um, so we're going to wrap that up. And I know that Jeremiah before brought up Bob Day, who Bob tagged me in a question yesterday, wanting to know what our opinion was on the show of Lloyd Hunnigan and Nigel Ben and whether they should be in the International Boxing Hall of Fame or not. Um, Jeremiah, I'm going to start off with you. Lloyd Hunnigan, Nigel Benn, are they Hall of Famers in your opinion? Um, well, Hunnigan certainly is not. I mean, uh, though, though I think this, this is a problem with, with modern boxing. I mean, it's working within this, this framework of 17 weight divisions, you know, three, four champions per division to Hunnigan's credit. You know, he, he, he wasn't like a, he wasn't like a number of these other um, European fighters where he, where he held on to a WBO title and defended it in his home country. You know, he wasn't a Sved Otki type. I mean, you know, he went to, uh, you know, Atlantic city, New Jersey, and he stopped a really good Donald Curie. I mean, he, then he beats Maurice Blocker, who's a pretty good fighter himself. You know, the technical decision, whatever, you know, he, he gets Vaca out of there in a rematch. You know, Vaca's a pretty good fighter. And then he gets stopped by Marlon Starling, who, you know, Starling was a damn good fighter himself. So was Breland. Um, but if you're hanging your hat on, you know, a win over Donald Curry, you know, and, and Maurice Blocker, I don't think that's good enough to get you rubbing elbows with, uh, you know, immortals. I mean, but that's sort of the issue with, uh, you know, the International Boxing Hall of Fame, isn't it? I mean, we keep having discussions, uh, you know, about guys like Hunnigan and and so many others because, oh, well, you know, Arturo Gatti's in there, Barry McGuigan is in there, but of course it's, you know, it's called the Hall of Fame, not, you know, it's not the Hall of Talent, right? So the, whenever people start talking about Arturo Gatti, I kind of, I kind of like to turn it into a different kind of, uh, you know, I try, I try to funnel it down a different perspective. Gotti, yes, I mean, he, he, he was not Hall of Fame material in terms of his ability. I mean, he was, he was barely a world-class world fighter in any division he was ever at. I mean, it, he, he's become, I think, extremely overrated, especially at 140 pounds in recent years. I mean, people are put him in, put, pitting him in hypothetical matchups against guys like Ricky Hatton, who were, you know, who legitimately topped the weight division. Uh, but again, what I work within the framework of, you know, uh, I, I try to do it within eight divisions. You know, Hunnigan, to his credit, he was, you know, a, a title holder at 147. But again, I, I can't see you hanging your hat on Donald Curry and Maurice Blocker and that getting you in. Um, yeah, you know, to me, I know, the equivalent of this is the NFL Hall of Fame letting Joe Namath in because he won Super Bowl three. You know, Donald Curry is the Baltimore Colts in this equation. Yeah. You know, you know, you had one huge win, one big moment, and I don't think one moment's enough. And see, when I was first asked this question, to me, just off the top of my head, Nigel Benn is a Hall of Famer, and I put that. He's a no-doubt Hall of Famer, but he's a no-doubt Hall of Famer because of the criteria that has all of a sudden, you know, come out. I mean, Nigel Benn had some really good wins, fought some great fighters. I mean, his win against Gerald McClellan. Tragic as it was, was a great win. And beat guys like Henry Warden, you know, he had the great series with Chris Eubank. Um, I mean, so, yeah, Iran Barkley, Doug DeWitt, who he came overseas and beat on American Shore. I mean, if I think he beat DeWitt in New Jersey and he beat Barkley in Las Vegas. So, I mean, I think with the criteria they do today, that I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. But I think the criteria, and I think you agree with me on this, Jeremiah, and I'm getting ready to ask John, but the criteria for me to, for being in the Hall of Fame, and it's for all sports, and I think they've dumbed down almost all sports Hall of Fames, the criteria should be the Hall of Fame should be the greatest that ever did it. Because if that was the criteria, there would never be a question that Lloyd Hunnigan should not be in the Hall of Fame. 
Because right. Lloyd Hunnigan is not on anybody's top ten in any division ever, even if you're using the junior divisions, John. Yeah, I, you know, it's. Uh, I think you know, looking at Bob's question, I think first of all, let me start with that. His question directly. You know, why aren't these guys in with some of the guys that are in? You know, Gotti's in, Mancini's in. Uh, the, Guys like Hunnigan and Ben, for me, would, would fall into like that, that kind of borderline category where the guys, you know, and there's a lot of other guys in there. For me, these jun- I don't like the junior divisions. I don't think we need them. And for me, a guy that did a lot of us fighting in junior division, if I think that he's a guy that where there are only eight divisions, wouldn't have ever picked up a lineal title. I have problems with those kind of guys being in the Hall of Fame. So for me, I could look on – who's already in, and, and find a lot of guys that, that, to me, it wouldn't matter if, if Ben or Hunnigan were in in front of them. Now, let me say, you know, in all Hall of Fames, I think, to me, uh, baseball's the only one that, that really has really tight traditional criteria where it means a lot. For, for me, in, in, in football, boxing, you know, even though, uh, of course, I'm a huge follower of boxing, and football, basketball, it doesn't matter to me too much who's in these Hall of Fames or not because I just think it's, it's so subjective in, in these other sports who they put in. You know, in the NFL, they'll put in an offensive lineman. You know, did the Hall of Fame committee really watch game film of, of these, these guys on the offensive line for, you know, their, their 16 seasons and, and see what kind of blocks they made and didn't make? Of course they didn't. They're just going on reputation. So, you know, you get some of that in other – in boxing, if, if if I were trying to have a true Hall of Fame, of course you would want to look at your greatest fighters of all time, like Mike kind of alluded to. You know, I'd only be looking at eight divisions. You know, who your, your no-brainers would be fighters who – you know, to me this would be your quote-unquote real Hall of Fame. It would be, you know, eight divisions, your fighters who – were in the top ten of their division all time or, or your no-brainers. You know, they're in, so you've got 80 guys right there. That's your no-brainers. And then after that, you're looking, you would be looking at people who picked up the lineal title if there were only eight divisions. And that's why sometimes if we're, if we're talking about Brits, you know, I look at a guy like Lloyd Hunnigan who beat Donald Curry uh, when Curry was considered one of the top fighters in the sport and was a true – unified, undisputed, welterweight champion. That, to me, is a greater achievement than a lot of these junior division guys. Uh, you know, Terry Norris was a good fighter, but, you know, you got Terry Norris fighting only at 154 pounds. You know, he, he beat up a lot of past-their-prime guys like Sugar Ray Leonard and Meldrick Taylor. You know, Terry Norris is a Hall of Famer. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying Terry Norris wasn't a good fighter, but, but the, the, there are just are some different examples. Ray Mancini, even though he was extremely popular, uh, and, and I think he was a really good fighter up, up through the uh, Arguello fight when he was very young, 20 years old, uh, and then I, I think they started to overprotect him and he deteriorated. But, you know, Ray Mancini never would have – I mean, he, he lost to Arguello, who was the lineal lightweight champ in a great fight, and, and Mancini fought a great fight. But that, to me, is what the criteria should be. You know, could, it's very hard – if you only had eight divisions and one champ a division, that's very hard to uh, pick up a title. That's why you want to talk about a Brit to me, who with all these junior divisions and, and all these belts and 17 divisions and four titles division, a Brit who's underrated would be Alan Minter, who picked up the lineal middleweight title when there was only one champ in the middleweight division. Uh, you know, the middleweight title stayed in its lineal unified form the longest out of all the traditional eight. Uh, when this craziness got started, and, and Minter won that belt. He got destroyed by Hagler, but, you know, when you picked up the lineal mil- middleweight belt then, you had to be doing something right. Uh, and I think that those kind of fighters, the gravity of their achievements now gets kind of lost, and, and you've got guys who, you know, pick up these junior belts, they fight who they want to in these junior belts, and people are talking about them being 15-time world champions. So, and my final thought on that would be I don't like this as a fan, but, but for those who really care a lot about the Hall of Fame, I think your criteria, I don't like this, but what's going to have to be going down the road if you're going to try to really have some legitimate criteria with the chaos we've got now, uh, if you're not willing to look at it, if there are only eight 
weight divisions, which I think the best way is to, then you just got to go to the simple basic common sense. Who did the guy fight and beat? And it's just going to be who during his career did he fight and beat, and you're going to have to make your judgment off of that. All right, so if Bob's listening, Bob, I would say with the criteria the way it is now, I would say you have an argument with both of them. Our argument here at The Grilling Truth is the criteria is too lax. Yeah, I, do much, we all agree much, on that, basically? I oh, agree. sure. No, no doubt about that. Yeah, and can I can I just can I just make a quick point? I mean, if if we're talking about you know just eight divisions, and if anybody you know you just you just Google uh, the Ring Magazine's annual ratings, okay, the late '80s and early '90s were loaded with talent, you know, at middleweight, and you know, so imagine you only have eight divisions there, so you only have middleweight and light heavyweight. So d- during this time at middleweight, you had. What James Tony, Mike McCollum, Julian Jackson, uh, Sumbu Columbe, Roy Jones Jr., Steve Collins, Nigel Bend, uh, Gerald McClellan, um, you know Chris Eubank, Michael Nunn, et cetera, et cetera. And and this is and I think John would agree. With me, I, th- I think both of you would agree. Oh, with me. you got Cat Columbe, uh, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mentioned him. This, this is yeah. the, this is the tragedy of the entire situation. I mean, listen to all of those names. Right. Okay. So the guys who jump up past 160, like Ben Eubank, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, Collins, who eventually moves up there. Yeah, they're in the company of an, an aging Thomas Hearns. You know, it's still a Charles Williams, who's pretty good. Virgil Hill. You know, better. Fight. Not a loaded division, but once you mesh those guys in at 175, then it's you know it's pretty loaded, right? So you have all of those names, and how many of them actually fought one another? I mean, Tony fought McCollum. Did he fight Jackson? Did he fight Colin Bay? You know, he fought Jones at, at 168. But there were just so many misses, you know, and it's because we had too many champions, too many divisions and whatnot. Uh, but ultimately, I agree. I mean, if, if, if we're going with modern criteria, I, I think, you know, McClellan's a pretty damn good win for Ben. Uh, you know, he, he had some other really solid wins. And I also think that you know, Ricky Hatton's going to get in and, and, you know, what was his defining win? Cost, uh, you know, a Slightly older cost, Yuzu. I, I think Ben probably gets in at some point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, I think you, you made the point with Ben, Jeremiah, that I look at with all these guys. I mean, because I didn't really address Nigel Ben, but for, for me, that's my gut on Nigel Ben, even with those good wins he had. And, and he certainly was a guy that provided a lot of excitement, no doubt about that. He was always in, in action fights, and somebody was going to go down, you know, when he was in the ring, whether it be him or somebody else. But, you know, would Nigel Ben have ever won a title with eight divisions, uh, one champ a division? I, I don't see where he, he would have he won one. And that, that's where I have problems with this modern criteria. All right, guys, so we're going to come to the end of the show tonight because i got another show to do here in a little bit. But um, any final words, John? I just I think the as we touched upon a little bit, but I think it really is important news in the business of boxing. Uh, to me, you know, at the top rank throwing in the towel today uh, on their pay per view fiascos that have been going on for, you know, for of course many years, but but really on the fiasco level for over a decade where, with the horrible undercards and fights that that really shouldn't be pay per view, uh, throwing in the towel. Pacquiao Horn going to ESPN, and, and it looks like we're going to get Lomachenko, Salido on ESPN, and, and I think that'll be a good opportunity for Lomachenko because I think he's going to blow out Salido this time, and uh, that and, and the casual fan that may turn into that will hear that he lost to him on the scorecards the first time, so it'll maybe look a little more impressive than it is. Uh, so, you know, that's that's good. I mean, I hope now that makes PBC just keep working on their game, whether you love it or hate it, or somewhere in between that, that PBC, you know, all their people are behind the McGregor Mayweather, and that if that is a four or five million buy, they, they have not been greedy on their pay-per-views, even though they're going to charge 100 bucks for this one. In other words, they've been very, very judicious about picking their spots. So I'm hoping they'll use that as a springboard for their platform on basic cable and, and some network fights. And uh, then, you know, De La Hoya's got his stuff on ESPN. He hasn't put much good on there yet. Uh, I, I don't feel, you know, that he gets pushed. Or maybe Golden Boy and, and Top Rank will have to start having some of their guys fight each other. And I say that because Heyman and PBC have such a deeper stable. They can put guys up against each other that really 
top rank and golden boy can't because they don't have enough fighter signs. So let's hope that this competition continues and it benefits boxing. All yeah, right, and, Jeremiah, final thoughts? Yes, and, and I'll, I'll piggyback off of uh, what John's saying right now. I just want to kind of give the fans a general overview of what actually is going to happen. So, you know, Jeff Horn and Manny Pacquiao, that's going to be the inaugural introduction to this. Um, but it's expected um, that they will host about seven fights or seven shows on ESPN slash PBC this year and maybe a minimum of 18 coming next year. So, you know, that, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty high work rate. And, of course, you know, lots of their guys like, you know, Crawford and, and you know, some of the, their up-and-comers, Conlon, you know, Shakur Stevenson, Lopez, et cetera, are going to gain a lot of uh, – sorry, gain a lot of exposure from that. So if, if that's true – good for them. It's just, you know, right now it's a matter of putting on competitive fights. And one other note, um, it's, it's also expected that ESPN um, will, will uh, put on some of its fights from its, from its library, from its classic library. They're going to be showing fights on this. So I'm excited to see that as well. Um, and I'm just hoping it all works out. I mean, you know, this is the... Fr- uh, boxing is laissez-faire capitalism run amok, and I'm hoping the competition brings out the best in these guys. All right, very good, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap the show up. I want to remind everybody, Replenishing Care, Inc. Technology, to Repl- Replenishing Care Technologies, Inc.com. Um, also, Gridiron Mo, don't want to forget them, and... Power Plus Mouth Guards. Make sure you check out all of our sponsors. You can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spreaker, Stitcher, wherever you find sports pad- podcasts. You'll find the grueling truth. Um, other things to look out for. We just talked about we had our first boxing debate show on, which hopefully we do more because I like to argue, especially with John since he's a lawyer. So I figure he's battle-tested, so it'll be a better fight. But <laughs> We, we had our first boxing debate show, which was whether Conor McGregor versus Floyd Mayweather Jr. is good or bad for boxing. So you can check that out. That's already up. It was posted earlier today. Um, you can check Inside Boxing Weekly every week. Um, tonight also, which you'll be able to find tomorrow, we will have the first Canadian Football League Pick'em Show of the, of the year with week one coming up in the CFL. We have former Syracuse superstar Robert Drummond, also a running back who I believe won four great cups in the CFL, also played with the Philadelphia Eagles. He'll be on there with us. Also, me and Jeremiah will be back with another boxing legend show this week as we'll have former lightweight champion Greg Haugen on the show. Make sure you check that out. And then we will have a baseball legend show later in the week with former Los Angeles Dodger Jay Johnstone. So for Jeremiah Pricer, John Einreinhofer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>